two weeks and I promise you guys are in for a treat today. We have an awesome panel of people and we're going to have a little bit of fun today. I'm not going to ask the typical real estate questions that you're used to hearing on a real estate panel. So we're going to have a little bit of fun today. There's going to be some thought provoking questions and I uh, hope you guys will enjoy it. So it will be a great pleasure to me if you guys could turn your uh, cameras on so I could see you. It's always a lot more fun when I can actually see the people that I'm talking to here. So if I could just ask you guys to turn your cameras on, I promise you guys all look fantastic. Actually, I take that back. Some, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. All right. Awesome. So today's going to be, today's going to be a lot of fun and we have a great panel of people on today. Uh, most of them are showing up at the top of my screen. I'm not sure about yours, but we have Scott, Brian, mm -hmm. Raffalina. Actually, I don't even see Raffalina. Rebecca, who we call Becky, right? We call you Becky or Rebecca. How do you want to be called? Whatever you guys want to call me, Becky, I'm gonna, Rebecca. I'm going to call you Becky. <laughs> Sounds great. But you have to change the name of your uh, thing because it says that you're Raffalina. We know you're not she, Raffalina. I'm actually with Raffalina. She's tending to the baby. So oh, okay. she should be up any minute. Cool. And we have Eric as well. So we have an awesome panel today. So I'm going to, I'm going to kick it off and I will, uh, most of the questions I'm going to let all of you guys answer, um, as long as you have something different to say than what the previous person has said. Um, and you're certainly welcome to pass as well. So I'm going to, I'm going to start off with Scott because I think this will be a fun question. Scott, if I were to look at your search browsing history on your phone or your computer, what would I find? No, actually, don't answer that. I'm just kidding. That wasn't a real question. I just saw your heart just drop. I just saw your heart drop. <laughs> All right, awesome. All right, so here's where we're gonna here's where we're gonna start at. Um, I'm gonna start with an interesting question because hey, Rafaelina, I'm gonna start with an interesting one because I'm actually curious uh, where you guys are gonna go with this. So on my screen, I don't know how it is on your screen. On my screen, it goes Eric. Scott, Becky Raffalina, Mike, I don't know why you're on my screen, and Brian. Mike, you're not on the panel, but you're on my screen. Um, so I'm going to go in that order. So Eric, I want to start with you. What do you think we need to do to advance the real estate industry in Philadelphia? Oh, man. <laughs> you're right. I'm ill-prepared for that. I'm going to pass for a second and think about it. All right, Scott, question goes to you. Um, I mean, I guess one thing that I'd like to see this just, I was just on the call with the, the BIA and right now construction is open, but on a limited basis. Um, they said that they're going to lift some restrictions in terms of how long people can be um, working during the day. Um, but I, I have projects that are delayed because we can't demo or underpin. I certainly understand the risks, but I'd like to see that resume. I think that would help um, bring new product to the, you know, to the market, especially since any project that would be demoed right now is not going to be, you know, available till the spring market next year. Um, and so, I mean, hoping for a healthy spring market next year, I'd like to see that stuff resume. Okay, cool. So let, let's take, let's, let's, let's keep on with this question, but I want to, I want to advance it past what we're dealing with in the current situation. Let's just talk about the real estate industry in general. What do you think it's time for in the real estate industry that we need, what do we need to do to advance the real estate industry in Philadelphia past the, the, the quarantine and the coronavirus that we're going on now. So we're going to go to our uh, dynamic duo, Becky Raffalina. <laughs> sure. Do you want to go first? I'll go. Um, so I think one of the things that I have been saying for a while, working with a lot of new construction builders, I would love to see um, advancement in design. So just design aesthetic, uh, you know, seeing things coming from Miami, New York, um, overseas in Italy, I'd love to see home design um, come to just come I guess just be a higher level, at a, done at a higher level. In terms of real estate sales, um, 
I'd love to see service almost at a level of like a Ritz Carlton, right? Like I, I, I carry that credo in my wallet. And I think that's something that just really like setting a standard to what, you know, I think a lot of people and then it's kind of like realtors are like they, protecting themselves from the realtor. So like just setting a standard of how service should be done, the way clients should be taken care of um, is something I'd like to see just across the board, I guess, not just not only in Philadelphia um, and then just community development. So something that I personally like to invest in is mixed use um, properties because I think small business is essential. So something that's really important to me is not just um, helping sell residential, but like how can we invest into the communities? Awesome. Becky, anything to add? Yeah, I, I mean, to add to that, I think that's um, a fabulous point to be made with the um, with the actual properties available and to further the um, the the already lucrative market that are bringing in people from Washington D.C., New York, um, and outside of the city. But mm -hmm. in terms of the agents co-oping together, selling the real estate in the city, I think when we all know when we co-op with the, on the other side, when we have a really pleasant experience, it's just a great, mm -hmm. great transaction from start to finish. It's happy. It's fun. Everyone is working towards the same goal, but. Um, you know, the seller wants to sell, the buyers want to buy, and then you have the, you, you know, then you can just talk about how wonderful the other agent is and then just help their um, reputation in, in the industry. But when there is tension or, you know, you're not working towards the same goal or some people feel like conflict, you know, brings power on their side. It's just, it, it shouldn't be that way. So I feel like we need to work towards getting everyone on the same page and, reminding each other that we're all working towards the same goal here. Awesome. Brian, you've had the most time to prepare uh, my <laughs> expectations for you. Yeah, don't, don't, have, don't, don't be too high because I don't know what I have. I, I would say um, similar to just what Rebecca said, um, cooperation certainly, you know, reminding realtors that if you're serious about this, this is a long-term business. This isn't just a year, two, or three years. Um, and, you know, That's a good point. Realizing it's not always a competition with other people. Yeah, we're all competitive. Yes, we want the listing. Um, we want our business to grow. Um, we also have to realize that um, other people are doing the same thing. You're going to be around a long time. And, um, you know, people make choices, right? Like, you know, one brokerage fits one person, another brokerage fits another person. It doesn't mean you're better or, or they're worse. It just means people are, you know, doing different things. And to respect that, remember, it's, it's a, it's a long-term thing and you're going to be around for a while. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing, you know, ethics, education, really, I think, um, I think KW Philly does a great job at this, but, you know, things like the zoning code, um, there's a lot of gaps in the normal agent business um, that, that really need to be filled for them to grow and, and, and do better things. You know, traditional single family homes where there, there's no curveballs, like, like you had mentioned earlier. Um, it's easy, but you know, how do we get people to really understand what's happening in the city um, and how they can benefit that, how their clients can benefit that, um, which ultimately helps everyone and makes the agent more money. So I'd like to see a little bit, um, you know, better job of that. Which KW really already does really well. Awesome. All right, Eric. Next question is going to you. All right, this is. I want to. I want to get an understanding from you guys. What is your What is your number one lead generation source? Now, I want you to answer this in two parts. What was your number one lead generation source prior to the quarantine and everything we're going through? And what has been your best lead generation source over the last two months? Mine has always been Zillow leads. Um, second would be open houses, which seem like they're going to probably be dead for a while. Um, and so Zillow leads have still been, even though they've been a lot slower, um, Zillow leads have still been you know, for the last two months, the most, and they're kicking back up now the last, I would say three or four weeks. So your answer be pro before it's the same for me. It's both, um, because I've been in the business for a relatively short time and not originally being from Philadelphia, I was only here for what, three years prior to, um, getting into real estate. All the work I did prior to this was all out of town and traveling. My sphere in the city and surrounding areas was relatively small. Um, so where I, you know, I, I think I had two, you know, people within my sphere by 
last year. Um, but, but Zillow leads, which I would never have expected necessarily for them to actually have worked out well. I don't think I hear a lot of good things from other people about them, um, but I've been very happy with it. Um, I do want to look into some of the stuff that, um, uh, what's the gentleman's name that does the, the tech trainings? George, right? George Kelly. George Kelly. Yeah. So he, sorry, my Microsoft is trying to update in, on me. Um, so the stuff that he's been talking about a lot have been doing various kinds of social media paid ads to get leads through command. And so I'm switching everything over to command over the you know past two months. And I think that that's going to be a significantly better way for me to do it. Cause I still, like I said, with my sphere being sort of small, I'm still going more for um, things outside of my sphere and not quite getting, you know, referrals yet. Okay. Scott, anything other than Zillow? Yeah. So uh, my business is really more so focused on like investment sales. So trying to find some new construction opportunities or rehabs that either myself or my clients um, would be interested in. Um, so historically, my number one lead generation source is, has always been door knocking. I try to get out in the streets multiple times a week, which obviously has been affected, um, you know, with quarantine and the stay at home orders. Um, but as like a compliment to door knocking, because the art of any deal really is in the follow up anyway. Um, you know, I've done a lot of cold calling and, and hopping on the phone um, historically. Now, um, I've been writing a ton of handwritten letters. I just feel like it's a very nice personal way to, um, you know, get touches out to your um, prospects and circle of influence. So I've written, I don't know, maybe like 200 or plus um, letters to people. And then, you know, in addition to that, just sticking with calls. Um, I feel like at this point, I've had some really productive calls with people. A lot of people are, you know, eager to get back to business and to talk business. Um, and so even though I can't, you know, walk up, knock on their door and have a nice conversation with them, um, I've just been reaching out by the phone and, and seeing, you know, where people's interests are, are right now. Now, who is it that you're, you're calling? You're calling sphere of influence or just random people? No, it's really just uh, more so uh, property owners, people I've identified as potential, um, you know, deals with a focus towards investment sales. So like, you know, I'll go on um, Google, just kind of, walk down blocks on Google Maps as if I was walking through the neighborhood, identify properties I like, and then just start calling them. Awesome. Queen B LLC, you guys are up. <laughs> uh, so when I first got into the real estate industry, I knew nothing about real estate. I was living in a city that I had no contacts in, no friends, no family, no sphere. And my number one source at that time for business was open houses. And I really um, 10X open houses. I, I door knocked the neighborhood the day prior. I, um, I, I actually, in order to get the open house, I went to the top producing agents in my office and I begged them to hold their listings open. And I specifically um, targeted first time home buyer price points. So I didn't go for those, you know, six, $700,000 homes. I went for the, the two, three, $400,000 properties to um, make sure I got the most traction. And could capture buyers that maybe didn't have an agent they already had a relationship with. So that was the biggest source of my business when I first got started. And then after being in the, the business for a little while, um, referrals from lender partners. So that's a huge source, um, really um, working with a lender that you know and trust and that you love and, um, and then you know feeding deals back and forth. And then um, it has to be a win-win or no deal, right? So we get, um, I get a lot of referral source, uh, referrals from my lenders. Um, and then also Zillow leads, I will piggyback on that. Zillow leads have really picked up um, in the last two weeks. Uh, and then also just calling on, so in Zillow, I have a huge database of leads that definitely fell through the cracks. I didn't have some great follow-up because, you know, we all get really busy. So in the, this downtime, actually the other day on Monday, I, I was just telling Raph, 9 to 11, I'm like, I'm going to lead Jen today. I, I don't do it uh, re religiously. I should. Um, and I it was proof was in the pudding on Monday, 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. I just called on some old leads. And I picked up two listings, two buyers, then the one seller, her, her daughter wants to buy literally in two hours in the middle of a pandemic. And then I'm like, you know what, this is, this is God telling me I need to start lead <laughs> every day. So that's been my biggest source. <laughs> How about you? 
Um, so just to piggyback what Becky said, so when I started, I actually started, um, I was actually building prior to sales. So I actually, my first listing was my first build. <laughs> so, um, which I would never recommend doing, don't list your own properties that you built. It's just, huge liability. But anyways, um, I listed the property and then I generated leads around that. And then I actually leveraged that listing to other builders where like I would walk, I would tell other builders, Oh, come through my property, see what I did while they were in sticks and framing. And I actually became kind of like a design consultant and I actually picked up, you know, five builders. And that next year I was, I had all of my business just come from those five builders. So like that was my first, um, two years in the business. And then from there it just became sphere. So, and you know, just what, um, Eric was saying and what Scott was saying about like the open houses and the door knocking. So like just getting in front, front facing and like always providing something of value. So if I was meeting a builder in Home Depot in the tile section, I was telling him, hey, um, just so you know, that white tile right there is what's selling like houses, like highest and best value. And like, I would be like, if you have any other questions, I leave them my card, like mic drop and like walk away. And I can't even tell you how many friends and like how I grew my sphere. It's actually how I found out about the BIA and like things that, and I was new to Philadelphia. So I moved to Philadelphia literally just knowing my husband and then I met uh, Becky was the second person and then I so I really knew nobody um and, good how are you uh, so, <laughs> um so I from there was able to what that did was I was very intentional about the relationships I built so I only built relationships in um within the real estate building and industry and, and now breaking into um, more buyers and sellers uh, just not that are not construction Awesome. Brian? Uh, so I was going way back an open house guy. Um, I did, you know, McCann's open houses um, for years back in Berkshire. And had my buyer leads, you know, converted them, they stayed in the database. And then, so your question leading up to the pandemic, it has kind of cut off from open houses and really gone more secure heavy and, and referral based. Um, and that was, you know, for the last couple of years. And then really, you know, for now, in, in what we're going on, going through right now, um, I'm even more into my sphere, into my database. Um, it, it's so much, people have time right now. Um, it's so much easier to engage people and talk to them, they're receptive. Um, I'm very careful about the message right now. I just sent an email blast out that I'm going, I'm, I'm trying to steer away mostly from an opinion and, about you know, what's going to happen in the future and just giving people facts. Um, I think we're in a situation right now where you know, I'd like to make a call and I will I will say a few things, but I also leave it a little open-ended for people and just kind of just drop the facts, um, give them numbers, whatever it is. Um, oh, I also, <laughs> I, I went back through my unsubscribe list in Constant Contact, which I always knew was kind of, Floating around, I, I think I was just nervous to see it. I was disappointed to see who who unsubscribed. I actually went through it, and um, you know, and why it happened was because a past buyer um, listed with somebody else recently, which I do a pretty good job of retention and, and converting my past buyers to sellers. Um, and I was obviously disappointed to see that. I kind of knew that they were kind of floating around, and kind of people I didn't follow up with that much. Um, but I really scrubbed the unsubscribe list and. and they didn't come back on the list, but you know, figured out a way to reach back out and reach back out and, and call them and, and get back to them. So um, sphere heavy right now, absolutely. Nice. All right, I have a surprise for everybody on the panel. Oh God. <laughs> At the end of this call, you guys are all coming on a plane with me. All you can bring is your laptop and your phone and your essential clothing and maintenance items. And we're going to go to a, an unknown city that you've never been to. Now this city is still on lockdown, just like we are, but you have 30 days to rebuild your business. You don't know anybody there. Tell me what you're going to do. Brian, we're going to start with you on this one. Um, it's still a lockdown. Yeah, same same as we are in Philadelphia, similar to what we're dealing with here. Okay. Or I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what, I'll give you the option to answer the question, 
how we're how we how we are uh, right now in Philadelphia, or you can answer it as if everything's good, everything's back to normal again. I'll give you the option. I'm more right. interested in hearing how you're going to grow your business from ground up. Right, right. Um, so the, the knee jerk to that to that question is, you know, you 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 affiliate yourself with brokers, you affiliate yourself with some, with some top producers, and I go right back to the open house. But you know, not not the lazy man open house like I did for for a decade of of you know putting it online and showing up you know five minutes before it started and then following up with people, um, hustling kind of like what Rebecca said. Um, you know, pinpointing an area. Don't don't try to sell the entire city. You know, become a, a local expert in a particular neighborhood. So take a block up before, um, you know, door knock like crazy. Um, build, start to build that um, that database fresh. So get those names, invite the neighbors, follow up beforehand, do the open house, follow up, follow up afterwards. Um, and, you know, do that as often as possible until you, until you really you know, build, you know, build yourself a, a, a database. Um, what else am I doing? So, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm going to pass it after that. That's my, that's All right. my, my primary thing. Okay, Rafaelina, you're, uh, we're going the opposite direction, so you're up now. Oh. Um, so, this is actually interesting. I don't know, Noah, one of our first conversations that I had with you when I was switching to KW Philly was, um, was friend, I would get on Facebook and I would make an incredible presence in like the neighborhood, um, like pages. I would friend a hundred people a day, send them a message, let them know who I was. So like kind of guerrilla marketing on social media. And I would rebrand myself dependent on what the needs of that, of that area was like, is this an area that, you know, gentrifying neighborhoods were seeing, um, new construction happening, or is this an area where there's uh, is this a college town? Is this high rent? So I'd find out what sort of the low hanging fruit is and I would focus in on that just to sort of make my presence. Um, once I've established myself there, one of the things that I did and, and I actually used to partner with Jim Roach, um, he used to have, when I first started, he would have, he had really great listings. So I would wait for him to put up a new listing and I would sit his first open house and, um, and I would sit the newer open houses for agents that I wanted to learn from. Um, and so I would reach out to that realtor and I would then I would work with them. I picked up a buyer lead from them. I was able to work with Jim and see how him and his team work through the transaction process. And I worked through that transaction process and learned from people that were steps ahead of me. So um, reestablishing my presence in the marketplace and like really narrowing into um, what needs and like what pain points I can focus on. And something I would do differently that I didn't do in my business is really create a lead generating website. Um, and I would focus in by having like trigger websites with um, like pain points, like what are five things buyers are looking for right now. And that's something that across the board, um, a lot of the top agents across the nation are doing where they have different, like they have their hub website and different leads that are and, and able to increase their SEO. So um, that that's where that's what I would do. Do these sound like great ideas? Are you are you are you doing them currently? Now I am. I had to learn that the hard way. Really? <laughs> I did some of those things, and actually, my social media um, is one of like it's actually number four as my lead generating source. So yeah, that is something that I do not as consistently as I should. But the, re yeah. the reason this is a this is a good question is because it, it's a thought provoking question that obviously if you had a little bit more time to think about it, you know, you come up with more in-depth answers, even though yours was pretty good, but you would get a chance to really think about what are the things that you should be doing in your business to start growing it again. And that's not something that we uh, do on a regular basis, but when you actually take a step back and think about what are the things that I should do to grow my business, then the next question you have to ask yourself is, am I currently doing these things? Mm -hmm. And if you're not currently doing these things, why not, right? Because these are, these are ideas of how to grow your business. And something that we all need to be focusing on every single day is business development. And you know that comes through lead generation, that comes through strategic uh, moves that we have to make, right? We're playing a, a chess game here as far as business goes. We have to figure out what strategic pieces we need to move around the board to get us to, to the goals that we need to be getting us to. So it's really just a good question to really think about in, in your business. So with that, I'm going to, I'm going to let Scott and Eric answer and then we'll, I'll uh, we'll keep it rolling. Cool. 
Um, so I think the first thing I would do if I didn't know anything about a city um, is that I would start to pull up a map of the city with an overlay of, of zoning or whatever um, like density guidelines the city has because um, again, my business is focused on investment sales, mostly um, like small uh, multifamily projects. So it's really, you know, targeting areas that have um, the ability to build multifamily, but there is certainly some development potential um, in that neighborhood. So I would just look to um, isolate like one of those neighborhoods that I saw some potential in um, and then go back to the standard lead generation um, tactics that I've always used, which is getting out in the streets, door knocking, having conversations with people, kind of figuring out the landscape by talking to people and presenting myself as more of like an old school, traditional realtor who um, is more about the relationships and the people than just like zipping through um, like calls or something like that. Um, in addition to that, similar to what Rafaelina had mentioned, I definitely walk into job sites to start building relationships with developers and builders to see um, if there was ways that I could work with them in the future, if it was um, them building for me or, you know, may, maybe me selling some real estate for them or sourcing real estate to them. Um, because obviously, you know, I'm trying to go out there and find investment deals, but I also want to source them to the right people, which then I can build out like strong relationships with who then become like my biggest clients. Awesome. Eric and then Becky, we're going to flip it back to you. Okay. I mean, obviously I, since I, use Zillow a lot, I would um, continue to use that in a new city. One thing that obviously this is making me think about um, some things that I need to do now, having formerly been in a creative business, I do have some relationships here in Philly with some creatives and have like email lists of, of creatives at, um, you know, photographers, art directors, things of that nature. Most big cities will have things like that. I think I would use my experience in that field to as sort of a jumping off point to um, introduce myself to people like that via email, phone calls, what have you. Um, <clears throat> I would certainly, and this is something I need to do now, step up social media. I like what Rafaelina said about making yourself kind of a local expert in the area, especially if I found a place in a city that was a place I wanted to live and had, uh, you know, the types of homes and the, for lack of a better term, the type of, um, you know, community that I would want to be in, that's probably where I would be. And I would try to, you know, become maybe the go-to expert via social media um, in that area. I need to do that where I am now, don't I? Sounds like it. <laughs> that's great. Awesome. So Becky, I'm going to let save, save, save the last uh, answer for you, give you plenty of chance to think about it. And then we're going to start the next one with you. Perfect. So um, this is actually exactly what I did when I first got into real estate in 2012. I was living in Columbus, Ohio uh, with my ex-husband and I didn't know the market. I didn't know school districts. I didn't know how to uh, put, do a CMA on a property. I, I knew nothing actually about real estate or anything in general. So what I did is I, I found the top producing agent in the office and I wasn't going to reinvent the wheel. I wanted to just look at what their daily habits were, what their actions were, what their routine was, and I wanted to emulate that. So I, I went up to her, I looked what her, her production was. She was doing about 10 million um, a year. She was an individual agent and she had one assistant. And at that time I was like, oh my God, that is, that is so much. I, I, I have no idea how I'm ever gonna do $10 million. Like, I, I didn't even know how I was going to do a million dollars. I, you know, I was a brand new agent. I had no idea how to get started. I had no business. Um, but I looked at what her schedule was like when she got to the office, what she did for lead gen, what type of, um, uh, the farms she farmed in, what type of property she worked. Um, and I asked to shadow her on listing appointments. I shadowed her on when she uh, showed properties and I, um, I looked to see what she did. And I, 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 followed in her footsteps and, um, and that's how I got my groove and how I figure out how to, how to sell real estate. So also, she also made a big, um, she had a presence in the community specifically. Um, I, so I decided to find my local, um, I was in a sorority in college. So I found my local alumni association to meet people and get out there and say, Hey, you know, so I, I joined my local alumni association. 
I gave them my business cards. I let them know I was in real estate. And you know, because they, you know, we had the commonality of both being in alpha fee, they, I got my first listing that way. And it was with um, an older couple who were downsizing and moving to Florida. And um, that was how I got my first listing. It sold in two days over list price. It was fabulous. And, um, and so the other girls in the, in the group saw, you know, how successful that transaction was and they started referring me. And then I started to volunteer and do things that were near and dear, dear to my heart. Um, which is, um, I work for a, um, a last chance ranch, which is up in upper Bucks County. Um, it saves horses and dogs and cats from slaughter and neglect. And I start, physically volunteering, donating, spreading awareness of the charity. And I get a lot of business that way, um, which is just a, an, an awesome benefit of being involved in giving back. So I would, that's what I would do if I moved to a different city or a different town, if I was new to the industry um, or I didn't know anyone, um, that's how I would dive in and get started in real estate. That's a great answer. I mean, it sounds like you really just promoted yourself. And the thing I always say is if if you're not willing to promote yourself, then nobody else is going to be willing to promote you either. Exactly. And it really all starts with you going out and putting yourself out there and promoting yourself. So, you know, you talk, I'm going to, I'm going to stick with you for a second. Cause you talked about some, some personal stuff and some stuff that you like to do personally, you know, this, this whole real estate game, it's more than just about business, right? It's about work-life balance. And that's a lot, a lot of times, a lot of a struggle with that work-life balance. Cause you know, unlike many other businesses, Real estate is, is a business that if you wanted to work 24 seven, you could work 24 seven. And some, some people have, have a, a problem and they want to work 20, not whether they want to or not, they work 24 seven. You really get burnt out on that. It's, an, it's important to have that work-life balance. So um, my question to you is uh, what has helped you to get where you are in your life and your career and what advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction? Yeah, so I learned um, early on. So prior to real estate, I was a district manager for Aldi food stores. I did that for a little over four years and I had no work-life balance. I was working 80 hours a week. I was a slave to corporate America and I was just miserable. Um, and I got into real estate because I... Um, I grew up really poor in a trailer park and I never um, had a, a house and I, it was my, my lifelong dream to live in a house that wasn't on wheels, right? So I got into real estate because I wanted to, um, I bought my first house when I was 24 and I wanted to help others know that it's attain home ownership is attainable. So um, I, uh, after leaving Aldi um, and, and doing something that I loved and I was passionate about, um, I, I found quickly that you can easily work 18 hours a day, always be on call, not have a life. Um, so I, from really early on, if, if it's not in your schedule, it doesn't exist. And I know that's a, a bold law um, and bold is great. I've taken it three times. Um, and so really I, I don't always stick to my schedule, but I try really, really hard to. Um, and then when you, when you, your clients understand that, hey, I have a horse. I ride horses five times a week. I try to ride my horse. And um, sometimes I do do it really early in the morning. Sometimes it's late at night. Sometimes I can do it in the middle of the day, but I schedule it in and I make it a priority because what is the point of you know, making a lot of money if you can't give back, um, make an impact in the community, inspire others and do what you love. So um, when my clients see that that's important to me, and that um, it really fuels my, my fire and my passion, then they actually respect my time more and they, um, they, they understand and, and they appreciate that I, that I set boundaries. So that's, I would say, try to implement that. I know it's hard in the beginning if you are working 18 hours, but try to just, you know, weekly add something in there that is something that fuels your fire and that really, you know, lights you up inside. Yeah, I love what you said. If it's not in your schedule, it doesn't exist. Your your schedule is your boss, right? We think yep. we don't have a boss, but your schedule is your boss. All right, Raph, while we're on the screen with you, same same question, I'll repeat it. What has helped you to get to where you are in your life and your career? And what advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction? Yeah, um, I had very clear uh, vision when I first started in the business. I, I originally did not want to be a realtor. I thought I was just going to build homes and then really realized that there was a need in the market for some of my services, having been in luxury fashion for many years. I've been working with 
some very particular clients, I felt that I could take the level of service that I had been trained in for years, having gone to hospitality school, um, mm -hmm and serve it into the business. And there's a lot of opportunity. Um, so we generated another stream of income. Um, I also invest heavily into passive income. Um, so I, I have a portfolio. So for me, real estate became this lifestyle. And what started happening was everything was real estate. My husband and I are in the business together. When we met at dinner, we would talk about real estate. We would get into bed and fall asleep going through the MLS. Um, so what started to happen was our lives became so focused on that, that we started to lose what originally brought us together. So we decided to reset our lives. Um, we have a very strong foundation in our faith. So we do a lot of philanthropic efforts. We go to Guatemala every year and we build homes for people who live in garbage dump communities. And um, these are things we do. We do a ton of things locally that we don't tell people about. We, we, fix the neighbor's stairs and roofs. And so through our business, we give 10% of every business we own. We, we contribute 10% of those earnings every single year. And what we've been able to do through that is that lit my heart on fire. The, the idea that my earnings could make an impact worldwide, locally for families, um, literally became my passion. So I work harder. So that 10, I don't even make yearly goals anymore. I make the goal of what I'm going to give. So if it's 10%, if it's 50,000, I know I have to make $500,000 this year in order to meet that goal. Um, once we had our daughter, which is, she's gonna be nine months next week. Um, she helped me get, uh, get on a routine. So my right now working from home, running multiple businesses without a nanny, you get on a routine real quick. Like, you know, so, um, have a kid if you cannot get on, uh, on a routine, but she, I see a lot of people shaking their heads when you say, <laughs> have a kid. it's the way, it's the way. Um, so I, I think of my life now that if my daughter picked up every habit that I had and was able to implement it in her own life, what would that do for me? So I, and my husband and I, you know, we're like, oh, that bottle of wine we used to throw back every night. Like, it's like, she's watching us and we're like, oh uh, man, we shouldn't do this. So um, that's how I, I got motivated and, and, you know, coming from very humble beginnings, uh, this industry is wonderful because you can be as, as great as you want, as mediocre as you want, every your efforts show in your success. So you can't lie about your efforts. Like if you're not lead genning every day, it's really easy to, to see that. So um, Bob Lucido said something that stuck out to me. If you wanna know how successful someone is, ask, to, ask them to show you their calendar. And that really stuck out to me. I mean, the number one team in the, what, in the nation is he? What, so yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's, uh, that's that. That's awesome. So it sounds like you're, you're putting your money to good use. The, you know, the, you're, you're reinvesting back in your community. They say money's only good for the good that money can do. And it sounds like you're doing good with the money that you're, that you're earning. So that's awesome. Yeah. Brian questions to you. I can repeat it. If you don't remember what it is. I, 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 have it. I wrote some notes down. Um, first thing, work hard. Don't be lazy. You know, you know, I know when I'm being lazy, sometimes I don't feel like doing something. I want to follow up. Um, so, you know, and that goes along with to me, customer service, going the extra, you know, mile for people, um, out of state clients, they have a need, you know, a lot of it, a lot of it's leverage based, right? If, if you know, I, you know, I don't know, you know, you're getting a listing ready for sale and it, you know, it just doesn't look crisp. It needs to be swept. It needs to be cleaned. You know, yeah, it's great to have people. Um, but you know, going that extra mile and just, you know, taking care of it whether you're physically doing it yourself um, or, you know, coordinating it and paying someone, whatever it is, um, working hard and, and really caring about your sellers, making sure they get, you know, the, you know, the, have the best experience and top dollar and on the, you know, buyers, the same thing. So um, they go hand in hand. I, you know, I was raised like that. You know, my, my parents are hard workers and, and I don't know any different. So that's straightforward. Um, save your money. So, you know, a lot of realtors come in and boom, they get a couple paychecks, you know, a couple commissions and boom, new car lease, whatever it is they, they need to put, a, put an image. It matters to a certain extent, but, you know, what really matters is, you know, having some money in your bank account for times like this. And I'm sure a lot of people, they would trade down their, their mercy this for a, you know, a Honda Accord to have a few extra bucks in their, in their bank account. So, you know, don't live crazy. Um, you know, I have, my wife has a nice income that helps. Um, if you're on your own, you know, just save your money. Don't live extravagantly. 
is, is kind of what got me where I'm at. Um, patience. So a lot of realtors are like, you know, boom, they got to go from zero to ten immediately and build a, a business of, of fifty million dollars, hundred million dollars from within a couple of years. It's probably just not going to happen. Um, to kind of know. They kind of know where you stand, know what you don't know. Um, you know, if there's, if there's one thing that first question we can fix in this business, you know, you know, getting realtors to realize what they do and don't know, you know, myself included, but um, just just kind of um, be patient, let it come to you, educate yourself, get experience, and keep growing to the next step. Um, and that goes into my short term, my mid term, and my long term goals. Always kind of have, always kind of know what you're doing for the next week, the next day, the next couple months. Know where you want to be in the next few years, and ultimately know where you want to be down the line. You know, five, ten, fifteen, twenty years from now, and then make sure you stay on course. Um, and then I think I said, I mean, the lead gen stuff is is you know we heard that at nausea. You know, you have to time block um, lead genning. Um, working, you know, on your business, not in your business, and I'm a little bit of a hypocrite because I get new leads and I, I, I work in my business all the time. Um, and then, the, you know, the, the schedule stuff, the kids, um, all that stuff is important. Scheduling your personal time and then, you know, for me sometimes, I'll just, you know, I'll just put my, my phone face down in the other room for a couple of hours and just say, I know there's nothing pressing right now, and then go do what I want to do, go in the yard and hang out with the kids and do something, and that gives me a little yeah, a lot, a lot of great, great points there. Let the business come to you, but also go out and get it through hard work. You know, put your phone to the side, avoid the distractions so you could stay focused um, and make sure you're not spinning your wheels because in the end it's about profit, right? Don't, don't, don't live above your means. Make sure that your expenses are not going up at the same pace as your, as your revenue is and, and always focus on profit and your bottom line and you know, the money that you're keeping in your bank account so that you could do what, you know, Rafaelina talked about and reinvest that money into passive income and start to build your wealth. Because we define wealth as having $1 more of passive income than you have in personal expenses. So you can be making money while you sleep. Because if you're not making money while you sleep, you're going to be working until you die, right? That's a Warren Buffett quote. And that's very relevant to the way that we try to build our, build ourselves up over time. So Eric, I'm going to flip it to you and then we're going to go to Scott. All right. Do me a favor. Repeat the question again. I just yep, want to make sure you got it. No problem. Uh, question was, what has helped you to get to where you are in your life and your career? And what advice would you have for others who want to set off in a similar direction? So touching on um, some things that were already said, um, certainly I started off, I, I luckily picked the right uh, um, company to start working with, which is all thanks to uh, my mentor, Steve Bizogni in the office. And um, having the, the good mentor, having the great training that I was able to get at the office, I felt like in the first four months, I was just in basically in college again, and then was ready to sort of hit the ground running. And I think I found that working with buyers is what I really like to do. The few listings I've had, um, I just don't enjoy it as much. I know that uh, the the red book says that's what we need to concentrate on, but um, I just like the I like to help people find, you know, this sort of mystical thing that they're looking for in the new home. Um, and then someone I don't remember where I read this, but someone said the term work life blend as opposed to balance. Mm -hmm. And I really like the idea of that. I don't, I think I fail at it a lot still, but um, so in, I, I'm trying to get better at, you know, types of time blocking. But one of the things that I think has made, made things a little bit easier and made me be able to have more of a balance a blend is that instead of doing just like, well, now I'm working and all I'm concentrating on is work and now it's family time and all I'm concentrating on is family time is trying to have a lot more loose time that is basically family time, but being available to, um, you know, to do work if I need to. So like my wife and I and our son like to travel as much as possible. And we have family all over the country and outside of the country as well. And so I think last year I was, I traveled probably, I don't know, like 10 weeks out of the year. But I just know that with a few exceptions, I'm still available. 
And so I can be with my family, but I can still be available for clients um, and be able to, you know, take calls when I need to, make calls when I need to. And being able to sort of blend the two like that, I think has, has helped. Um, and I don't know that I agree with Rafalina about having a kid <laughs> makes you get a better schedule. Um, although it has between that, you know, only having been in this business for a year and a half and, and having a three-year-old now, those two together have definitely made me get up a lot earlier than I used to and try to in, utilize, even if it's just through enjoyment, you know, a little bit of quiet time in the morning that I never did before. Um, let's see. Well, it sounds like it sounds like the important lesson that I took away from what you said was you have started to figure out what you're passionate about in this business. And the great part about this business is that there's so many aspects to real estate. You don't have to be pigeonholed into one thing. You can enjoy working with buyers. You can enjoy working with sellers. You can enjoy marketing or operations or uh, acquisitions or running a business or working with developers or there's a thousand, you know, a hundred, whatever different aspects to real estate. And the fact that you are recognizing early in your career, what it is that you like and what you're passionate about. I think that's great. And that could change over time, right? right. Over time, your priorities might shift and you may decide that you need more time in your day and you want to focus more on working with the sellers at that point. And that's okay too. And that's the great part about real estate. One thing that I discovered that was extremely surprising to me is prior to becoming a real estate agent for 15 years, I've been a professional photographer photographing um, interiors and architecture, hotels and homes and, and things like that. So I absolutely assumed that one of my, you know, big areas that I would excel at is photographing my own listings. I figured out on the first one and there's been, you know, less than half a dozen now, but on my first listing after photographing it, I was like, I am hiring somebody to do this because the way that I used to do it um, in my other career is it's just a totally different animal. And it was really interesting to see something that I thought that I would be, you know, saving money by doing it myself and sa not saving time exactly, but getting a better product. And I realized that because it's, so different than what I expected it to be. I'm better off to, to hire someone that does that specifically and spend my time doing something else, whether it's with family or um, on some other aspect of the business that I think will actually bring in more revenue. Absolutely. No, I appreciate the insight. All right, Scott, finish us off with this question. Um, I think what's helped me most in my career thus far is certainly like the relationships that I've formed and the mentorship that I've had um, from some key individuals, including my father who just, you know, runs his own business and understands like the struggles, at least in the first like year or two. Um, I think that was, that was really helpful. So just seek out those relationships. I mean, there's a million different ways to do it. We're in sales. We know how to cultivate relationships, but I would certainly encourage everybody if you don't have a mentor who is focused on what, or is doing what you want to do, um, see, seek them out, um, ask for help, and maybe they'll be responsive. Add some value, maybe they'll be even more responsive. Um, in addition to that, I, I think mindset training. Um, I think I was very naive when I first graduated college many moons ago, um, and it took me a while to just understand like what it took to truly be successful, not just have talent, but um, to really put it to work. And from that, you know, I mean, there's millions of books and podcasts that I could recommend and you could reach out if, if you want um, for some recommendations. Um, but one thing that I started to do in my life that I thought um, really just helped me stay focused was on Amazon, you can look it up. It's like 20 bucks. It's called the five minute journal. It's just a daily reflection at the beginning of every day um, includes like some affirmations. So similar to like all the mindset training that KW preaches through bold and all of those teaching services it's just a really easy tool. If you don't have five minutes, you know, to dedicate this, you know, your mindset's probably off. Yeah. Awesome book, right? It looks like this. <laughs> what is it? What's the book? <laughs> yeah, it's great. I mean, it's just, you, pr you practice gratitude, you give yourself a daily affirmation and you set up three ways that the day is going to be great. Um, and then at the end of the day, you spend another minute or two saying how you could have improved the day. I think, you know, reflecting on yourself, um, 
that much is really powerful if you're trying to like achieve some goals. But what I would say about that is try to keep it simple. Um, like, you know, the GCI numbers that everyone gives you kind of takes your yearly goals and tracks it back down to weekly performance. That's pretty much like the number one thing that I focus on every single week. How many touches am I making? Am I hitting my goals? Cause I'm just trying to like trust a process and not get too worked up since results take time. Um, you know, I just try to hit my numbers. So anywhere from 50 to hundred contacts a week, depending on my week, you know, because um, I do have, you know, investment properties that I'm trying to um, like design or manage or whatever. Sometimes if I need to put too much focus there, then, you know, I'll go to a lighter goal of, of just 50 contacts a week. Um, but what's helped me also stay focused is, is time blocking. Um, at least always having um, lead generation time blocked into my, my schedule. And I don't try to like go crazy uh, two hours, four days a week, I think is, is plenty. People can say they can do more, whatever. Um, but I just build it in. If you need an accountability partner to hit that, um, that's certainly a strategy a lot of people use. Like when I go door knocking, I go with one of my buddies um, and it just helps both of us stay accountable. Um, and honestly, there's a little bit of peer pressure there, you know, like you want to try to get more deals if you're with people, at least that's, that's what I've seen. And, and that's why I like working with, with who I work with. Um, but in terms of just having a balance, I mean, when I was in law school, I used to like work as hard as I can burn out for a week and work as hard as I can burn out. Um, and what I've done since then is just, since I'm like, you know, focused on goals in my career, I also set goals in like my personal life. Um, I think that helps me um, stay a little bit balanced. If I'm, you know, focused on 50 to 100 contacts a week, and that's just my way to simplify that. I'm also focused on getting to the gym four times a week. And I time block that in um, to just give myself some personal satisfaction and a little bit more balance. It shows, buddy. We can tell you've been going to the gym. <laughs> Listen, there's some, some awesome, awesome points in there. Um, I actually forget the comment that I was going to make uh, off of what you were saying. Um, maybe it'll come back to you. Yeah, maybe it'll come One thing that I really liked from, um, <clears throat> I think it was a mastermind we did like a month ago, or maybe it was just a team meeting where we were like talking about, you know, focus and trying to get through this. Somebody said, and it, I think it's from Gary Keller's one thing um, that uh, if what you're doing is not related to your one thing, your one goal, even if that's just a daily goal, then it's a distraction and you got to eliminate that. Mm -hmm. I've taken that one to heart. Um, I am always trying to figure out what's a distraction in my life and eliminate it um, because, you know, I've, I've certainly said yes to too much sometimes um, in certain circumstances when a no would have been perfectly acceptable. So I'm just trying to figure out, you know, in my business, in my life, like what's a distraction? Cause you only have so many hours in a day. If you have lofty goals, you got to apportion that, you know, appropriately. I, f I found that the, a lot of times the thing, the, the things that make people the most successful are the things that you don't see, right? They're the things that they don't put out there that pub to the public. And it's, sometimes it's things that they don't even realize that they're doing. And, you know, just from hearing you guys talk and from all the successful people that I've studied, they have a schedule, they have a routine, whether that's a workout or a certain time of day that they wake up. Um, they have certain things that they do that they're focusing on from a high level, you know, to, to, uh, to a big extent, they're avoiding distraction. And Scott, like you said, they, they, understand how to say no to things you know the the challenge with today's society is that you get rewarded for saying yes to things and you get kind of looked down upon for saying no to things right but by saying no to things you're uh if you're if you're being strategic about the things you say no to you can say yes to the things that are the most important in your lot in your life because you know whenever you say yes to something you're saying no to something else and, vi and vice versa and that's the biggest challenge that you have. And, you know, I've heard a lot of great things from you guys in terms of the, the secrets to some of your successes. And you probably don't even realize that you're, that you're doing some of these things. All right, let's, uh, let's keep it rolling here. Um, so this next, next round of question, I'm going to do rapid fire because I want to respect everybody's time. <clears throat> so try to keep your answers limited to like 30 seconds. 
and that's going to be hard for you. So Scott, let me stick with you for, for this one just so we can keep it rolling. Perfect. So give, give, I always find it interesting uh, to understand the books that people are reading. And I've gotten some of my best book recommendations and podcast recommendations just from asking people. And I, I read three to five books a month typically, or I do audio books and some months more than that. Um, I have more books on my list that people have recommended than I even have time, time to read, but I still like adding them to my list because depending where you're at in your, in your mindset, depending where you're at in your business, you know, you can shift topics. So it's good to have a, a good list. So the question I want to ask to you guys, and just give me your, give me your number one, uh, number one book and or podcast recommendation. Yeah, sure. A uh, book I read this year that I like fell in love with, Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Very I fun. think it's Very incredible. Fun. Yeah. Who recommended that to you? Uh, I don't remember. The one you recommended was Relentless. I recommended that one too. That, that was <laughs> way up there too. Which one? Relentless. It was like yeah, the follow up. I hit you up. I was like, nothing's packing a punch like Can't Hurt Me. What do I read? You said yeah. Relentless. And that one. He's, he's all over the new Michael Jordan uh, documentary, The Last Dance. He's all over that one. And yeah, that's the cool. that's the guy that trained Michael Jordan. Yeah, so I guess my my most recent top two come from you. Great, I got more. I have more where that came from. <laughs> okay, let's move it down the line, Becky. Book or podcast? Uh, yeah, so podcast. Um, it's uh, the podcast host. His name is Andy Frasella, and it's called Real AF. Stands for as <laughs> you know curse word. Uh, so real AF, it's amazing. Um, he is a, um, owner of a supplement company out of St. Louis, Missouri called first form. Um, fitness is really near and dear to my heart. Um, and he's, he's fabulous. Uh, you, you guys will be hooked. Um, book atomic habit habits by James clear. Good Just book. got done reading that for the third time. And it really sparked it reignited a new flame in my, in my, my soul yeah. after reading it again for the third time. It's awesome book. Yeah. That's an awesome book. Mm -hmm. Raph. Um, so, I mean, all things based in faith for me, I'm in my Bible every morning. However, the book that has skyrocketed my business and my life would be think and grow rich Napoleon Hill. I actually listened to, I've, I've listened to it for like 60 days straight on audible, like to like, implemented into my subconscious mind but that's uh that book changed my life so your book recommendation is the bible one and then think <laughs> just it. kidding i just messed with you i'll buy you one now <laughs> <laughs> brian what's yours um, recently it was, it was uh finish give yourself the gift of done by, by um i'm a you know i'm a proud analysis guy a little bit of a procrastinator so networking through some tools of just kind of getting it done and moving on to the next thing. Cool. Eric, do you have any recommendations? Um, the book that I read about a year and a half ago that sort of right when I started uh, real estate and got me to have a total mindset change about um, finances, basically, was Automatic Millionaire by David Bach. Mm -hmm. um, and then that led me down a series of paths that took me to um, – the financial independence movement podcasts and books, which then led me to like bigger pockets podcast. Um, but it's funny, it all started from that automatic millionaire book by David Bach, which now seems quaint compared to where my mind is now, but I wouldn't be where my mind is now without having read that book first, which I think I listened to the audio book about five times over the course of five months. Yeah. It's hard to give one recommendation because it really, when people ask me for a recommendation, I ask, you know, what topic do they want to focus on? Because there's, there's best books on so many different topics. So um, I know that's a tough question. So I'll, I'll give you my recommendation of just a, a general great business book. And it's called The Road Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham. And Keith Cunningham, if you don't know, he was the, uh, he was the actual rich dad from Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And the way that he's able to explain stuff and business concepts, it's like nobody else I've ever heard before. And he's, he's absolutely amazing. So uh, that would be my book recommendation. As far as podcasts go, uh, business podcasts, uh, I would recommend Naval. It's uh, the guy is Naval Ravikant, but the name of the podcast is Naval, N-A-V-A-L. It's about, it's really just about wealth building. It's a wealth building podcast. And I think it's just, it's really good. So I would listen to it all the way through, start from the beginning and, and just go down the list. 
All right, next rapid fire question. Eric, we're going to start with you. Keep it to 30 seconds or less. Um, what's the question you are most tired of hearing on the, sub, on, on the subject of real estate? And what would you like to say about it so we never have to answer it again? Oh, um, quiet. I need, I need a moment to think about it. All right, Scott. Uh, I always dislike when um, first time home buyers are fixated on uh, whether or not this is a good investment for them in terms of like, how much is this going to be appreciating every year? It's like, that's impossible for me to tell you. And you shouldn't even, like, I, I don't even think people should be thinking that way when they're buying their first home. So it always frustrates me. Yeah. How much is my house worth when the tax abatement's up or what's more of my tax? Yeah. I'm just back? like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool. Becky. Um, oh God. One that really just grinds my gears is when sellers tell me that their house is worth something because Zillow tells them it is. <laughs> And I'm like, no, it's not. And then I have to go into the whole explanation. And that would be one question that if I could eliminate that and never have to answer it again, that would be it. <laughs> nice. Helena? Um, can you discount your commission? <laughs> Ooh, yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> Brian, What's the question you're most tired of hearing on the subject of real estate? And what would you like to say about it? So you never have to answer it again. Most of the questions I feel like are people, I, I feel for people, right? Because they just, they usually just don't know. So I, I, I try to have patience with that. Um, I don't know. I give the, the dumb question of, you know, when can I move in, you know, if they're buying a house and you know, people don't understand the concept of what to sell, you can go in and the minute after the settlement's over, but that's, I don't think that's fair. Um, I don't know. One thing you said, one thing we could change in the industry was one of the first parts that I thought about. One thing that just drives me nuts um, is that the days leading up to settlement, that you know, that week before settlement, and that that dialogue and that 900 emails you have to go back and forth with the title company, lender, closing person. That whole process just drives me insane. I, I can't believe that us as professionals, um, regardless of title company and lender, I can't believe that us as professionals have to figure out a way to make that process a little bit more streamlined so we don't have to you know, do that. That was a little bit. Sorry. All right, Eric, do you have an answer or you want to take the next question? Yeah, no, um, it's not a question exactly, but I, I wish that buyers wouldn't anchor to listing price so hard and think if, it's, if they buy it for less than that, then they got a good deal. If they pay asking or spend more, then it's a bad deal. And look at what the, you know, the real value of the house is both in the market and to them. Yep. And yeah, that's it. If they could just understand that that number is a little bit arbitrary. Okay. All right. I have a whole lot of questions, but I'm going to, in respect of everybody's time, I'm going to wrap it up with one last question. Okay. Here's, here's the question. We're going to start with Scott. It's actually a two part question. I'm, I'm going to merge two questions into one so I can get best bang for my buck out of you guys. All right. What is the one piece of practical advice you would give to somebody starting out? That's part one. And then is there anything else we're leaving out that we didn't ask that you want to talk about? Uh, practical advice uh, would simply be if you think you're lead generating enough, you're probably not. So just double down. People, you know, set arbitrary numbers of 50 or hundred contacts a week. Do as many as you can at all times um, because that's really how you're going to generate the most amount of business. And uh, yeah, I mean, as far as anything that we haven't discussed, I don't, I don't know if I have anything. I feel like we did a good job covering everything, but maybe at the end. Yep. I have a long list of more questions, but I want to respect everybody's time. All right, Becky, we're going to keep rolling down the line. So I think Scott made a great point when I got into real estate, you know, most people think you're in the business of selling houses. You're really in the business of lead generating. So reminding people of that and you need to perfect the art of lead gen and not selling real estate. It's just a subsidy of lead gen. Um, and uh, I didn't sell my first house until six months uh, after I was licensed. So having six months of reserves in an account, um, to make sure you can comfortably live and, um, and not be so stressed out that you feel like you need to get a second job. So that would, that's what I would 
you know, tell my, my, my old self in 2012. <laughs> Definitely have six months of reserves when you start and then always maintain six months Employee. of reserves. And put money aside for taxes at each commission check. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Rafaelina? Yes. Yeah, so uh, if you are doing this solely for the money, it will get old very quickly. So do not attach yourself to the paycheck. Like you're here to provide a service. And in the result of providing incredible service, you will, success will follow. So if you're doing this, um, you know, I think of uh, a lot of people in our brokerage that do things at a really high level. And, um, you know, if you're not enjoying the journey as much as the destination, this can be a very intense emotional game. There's highs and lows in the industry. So it's a head game. So if you're, um, if you're only attached to this for the money, it's, it can be grueling. So, and, and I've seen a lot of people get burnt out very quickly because of that. So that's, that's one, uh, one point. And uh, the other thing I just want to touch on is that um, as a real estate, um, you know, as a realtor and also a real estate uh, investor, um, it is really, really important to build wealth through, you know, being, building long-term wealth is really important. And so if that's not something you thought of and setting your goals this year um, and you have questions, like I'd love, you know, I can absolutely help anybody, but it's, it's really vital that you're not spending everything you make and that you're reinvesting. Um, whether it's, you know, reinvesting in yourself first, your education, number one, um, but secondly, reinvesting long-term because it, it'll make a difference over 10 years. What, what you, you'll always spend what you make. You'll always find something to spend on. Um, so don't, don't make the banks rich, you know, yeah. I, mm -hmm. you have to have long-term perspective. You're building yeah. that business of the future, right? So when you retire, when you decide to stop grinding it out as hard as you are now, you've had that next business up and running already, which is the passive income. Yeah. Cool. Brian. It's, uh, it's not like million dollar listing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's hard work, and it's um, and it's a sales business. It's you know, it's not a real estate business. It's a sales business, and it's you know, I think it's going to be fun because your friend did it, you know, part time. Um, you need to change your mindset. You're probably not going to work out because it's it's almost like a restaurant with a ninety percent failure rate. In business. What I will say about million dollar listing is, you know, those guys make it look easy, but I am positive they put in a lot of hard work and they yeah. really did the right things in the beginning to get their business to the level that makes it look easy right it didn't just happen like that from day one all right eric finish think, us off strong buddy i think my biggest advice uh for someone just starting out would be to find a really good mentor that will help educate them help you know be their cheerleader when they're having their um, early and even later successes, help walk them through you know, the struggles that they're having. Um, I feel like I probably couldn't have done this without that. Um, I also loved what Rafalina said about the building wealth. I, didn't, I started this 18 months ago only thinking about it as like a job. And I mean, the whole, the whole culture here has really made me <clears throat> get that mind shift. Um, and it happened pretty quickly. Yep. From the outside, it all looks like we're playing the same game. But the game that we're teaching is how to be business professionals, how to build that wealth, but how to do it through real estate, right? So, you, so you, ha you, you in, in some sense, you do have a job. Your job is to come in and lead, generate, and develop your business and be a real estate agent and sell houses. That so that you can take the money that you earn from that and reinvest it into something else, whether that's, you know, new construction flips or whether that's the, the passive income or investing in other businesses, that's the long-term goal, but you can't do that if you don't have the money from the job to be able to do that. So it's, it's a process and you can't really skip any part of that process if you want to, you know, make it. And it's, it's a long-term game. You have to have long-term perspective. You have to be able to keep chipping away at it every single year. Um, there's a compound effect that occurs when you're doing that on a regular basis, which is, that's another good book recommendation, Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. And if you keep doing that and you keep chipping away from the outside, it looks like we're all playing the same game of seeing who can sell the most houses. But from the inside, when we talk about it with you guys, you realize it's not just about selling houses. 
that's the lever, that's the fuel that you need to ignite the fire to be able to go out and start those other businesses, to be able to go out and invest in other properties, to be able to build that wealth, that generational wealth, so that you can live that perfect life by design and, and, and have the things that you want to have in your life. So you can, like we said before, you know, use that money to do good things with it and live that, live the way you want to be living freedom. Right. So real quick public service announcement tomorrow is Keller Williams red day. It's an annual red day. Um, and we are, since we can't all get together for red day, like we always do, which is always a great time. We're doing a virtual and eh, virtual, whatever, a 5k, 5k race. So you have to go out and walk or run a 5k and send your, your times in. And, uh, you know, we're all going to be, uh, sharing our, our times through the market center and through the broker, just a way to get together and raise money for charity. So that's what we're doing tomorrow. And then, uh, on Friday, we're finishing off education week with Jeff Cohn, who's one of the top uh, agents in the country. He's out of uh, Omaha, Nebraska, uh, just came over here from Berkshire Hathaway earlier this year, was the number one agent at Berkshire Hathaway after Mike McCann left. So we have a great lineup to finish off education week. And I appreciate you guys being here today. And thank you to our panelists. You guys did an awesome job. I took a ton of notes here and got a lot of great insights in here. And you you know, you, you just kept it positive and kept me motivated to go out and grind it out for one more day, right? Every day, just, just keep grinding it out for the next day. So thanks for being here, guys. I really appreciate it. So go out and take some action and have an awesome day. Thanks, Noah. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, everybody. <laughs>